explicamos algunos elementos de análisis que, que vamos a utilizar hoy día. Y, hoy día la, toda la sesión será que, dedicada a flujos cognitivos. Y como le, lo hemos visto, la, la idea de estos flujos cognitivos es empezar con cualquier superficie o cualquier variedad y deformarla en la dirección de las curvaturas. Entonces, me voy a, a, a empezar con, recuerda algunas cosas sobre las curvaturas en general, en geometría de mañana, y pues será la, la parte de fondo. So, maybe this small section will be kind of obvious for some of you, but I want to be sure that you have in mind what means this geometry field. Let's first start with the surfaces of R3. So we have some surfaces embedded in R3 with its Euclidean metric. So at each point, for all x in M, the tangent space at R3, which is the set of all vector beta at this point, is the tangent space of the surface, and the direction generated by the normal. So this sign means that it's direct sum and that's it also with the with the norm of normal being one. So the second fundamental form So you take the normal vector film and you make it evolve in the direction of W. You have some direction and your normal is evolving. And you look at how it evolves and you take the derivative in this direction. So this gives you a new vector and you make the scalar product this vector field okay. so this is a bilinear form and basically you see describing how the normal evolves describe the shape of your surface of this company. Mm, I forgot to assume a minus. Okay, so 
many of you may have only seen this definition. Um, a major theorem like Gauss. So Gauss called the theorem egregum. And what means egregum? In Latin, it just means that it's a very important theorem. And it's not that the curvature, so I will write this kg of x, the curvature kg only depends on g and not on the amplitude. This means that if you deform your hypersurface, but you, but you don't change the length of the, of the vectors on the surface, the curvature will be the same. The normal will change, the second fundamental form, second fundamental form will change, but it determinant will not change. So this is an intrinsic notion. But it's only for surfaces. So now we're going to go for a higher dimension. So in higher dimension, you've got at least three notions of curvature, which I'm going to explain. So, you have your point x in the manifold, you get two tangent vectors, and they generate a surface. Uh, 
to be the girls' group trip. Of these very surface at point X. Okay? So I'm taking a, a submanifold, which is just dimension 2, and I'm looking at this curvature. It is this called the sectional curvature <coughs> in the direction. So in general, for each plane, you will have a different curvature. So the good point is uh, that the sectional curvature control all rule of geometry. Basically, if you know that all sectional curvature in all directions, you know all you can know on your manifold locally. And the bad so this is a good point. And the bad point is that in general they are very hard to control. Okay? Because <coughs> there are so many directions that you cannot control everyone. So the idea to get some better control is to make some average of this value, of this curvature. So, the first one is called Ritchie curvature. So, at a point and direction, at a tangent vector, what is it? So when normal V is what? You take the sectional curvature of V and another vector and you make an average on all the tangent vector which are orthogonal to V with long one. And and there is a constant coming there which comes from another possi possible definition of the Ritchie curvature. And this is a little bit measure on this view. So you fix a direction, and you take all possible orthogonal other directions which are orthogonal, and you make an average of the curvature. So this gives you a rich tensor. <coughs> um, something which is not fully obvious, I write it that way, but there are some other way to define it which makes it simpler is that the rich tensor extends as the quadratic form on the, on the standard space. So I probably this mean this could be something quite weird, but it's just a quadratic form. And last notion of curvature, which will be the scalar curvature, well, 
I think it's still the same. Here I have, before I had two vectors, I made an average and I have all left in one direction. So I'm going to make the average in all directions. So here I was doing some average on the sphere of dimension n minus 1 because I had lost the dimension by including that I was orthogonal to v. Here I'm doing the average on the sphere of dimension n for all directions. Okay. So something which you can Easily see from these definitions and the following. If the curvature is a is some constant. Then the rich tensor is just what <coughs> an n minus one out times this constant times the metric, which is which you can see at the identity quadratic form. Okay? And this implies that the scalar curvature is everywhere the same value. A classification of Riemannian manifolds with symmetries. That we call the scale of symmetries in the Riemannian geometry. Most symmetric one are those with constant sexual curvature, and there are very few of them, which are these are the Cushing's of R n as in group, some discrete group. These are called flat manifolds. The Cushing's of S n by some finite groups, they are from spherical spaces. And the cushions of the hyperbolic plane space by some group. And these are hyperbolic plane. And each one corresponds to the value of lambda, the first one corresponds to lambda being zero, and the second one to lambda being the last one. Oh, okay. nice. So these are the most symmetric remaining metal you can find. Then you have the manifolds such that the Ricci tensor is some multiple of the metric for a fixed number. So these one are special keys. These manifolds are called Einstein manifolds. And then you have the less symmetric one but still with some symmetry. The one with constant scalar curvature, which is our goal, you have a matrix. And as you can see I have less, I have less some space here. 
for a very special kind of manifold, which are called locally symmetric spaces. If some of you have already studied Lie groups, so these are defined so that this big G is a Lie group. the action of the group. So this leads to a lot of symmetries and these one are special cases. And all these locally compact symmetric spaces locally symmetric spaces, sorry, not necessarily compact have constant scalar curvature. And some of them are Einstein it's when you cannot split them into two different ones because if you take two different which, which are Einstein but not with the same constants and then you would not have an Einstein metric so these are Einstein when they are what is called in decomposable okay so now the trick is the following these manifolds are very well understood but they are also very rare. Because in general, when you start with the manifold, you cannot find some structure like that. It's too, too much to ask. These are also well understood. There are more than this one, but not that much. Meaning that we know plenty of examples of manifold which do not admit such a metric. And this Einstein metric, we know less about them, but there are a lot of them. Not on every manifold, but there are a lot of them. And this one, well, the good point for this one is that they always exist. general idea about how we can use the geometry to understand the topology. So, if there is no symmetry, just no hope. If you start being there, then there is some hope. And then you can try to climb the scale. Okay. So, the general idea from geometry any metric you find the Yamabe metric if you manage to do it you try to find an Einstein metric And if you manage to do so, you try to find either a lofty symmetric space or even a constant curvature metric. And 
when if you reach this step, you're very happy because to understand Lie groups and load this metric space, there are plenty of algebraic tools which allows you to understand the topology. Okay. So, and the idea, of course, that after <coughs> some good cases, you can use geometric flows to do these steps. And today I'm going to explain you this part. Let me enter the key parts of my topic, which are two family of geometric flows, which are called Yamabe flow and Ricci flow. So the Ricci flow is the, the one you, you may have heard of. The Yamabe flow is easier to deal with, so I will start with this one because it's, to explain you, you will understand it far better. But it's only allows the first step. The, the rich flow allows you to, to do the second step, and sometimes even the third one. Okay, so what is the Yamabe flow? So, the family of metrics. is a solution for some T and some integral is a solution to the curvature normalized Yamaha method so I will write for the sequel C Y F so C for curvature, Y for yellow bay and F for types. Even only if you have the two following condition. At the beginning your curvature is pinched between two constants. Okay. And when you make it evolve You're doing the following tr trick. So this is the equation. The derivative of the metric is the scalar curvature times metric itself. Well, not exactly the scalar curvature, but the difference between the scalar curvature and its maximum. Oh, the value was maximum at the beginning. Okay, so this is still the same idea. We deform the metric in the direction. The curvature is constant and equal to its maximum everywhere, nothing happens. You just get the derivative being zero. Okay? So you have a fixed point for this flow. And what we will show you that actually if you start with another metric, it will converge to this fixed point. So the theorem I want to explain you the following. written this table a few years ago. The, we start with the compact Riemannian manifold. And you assume that it has <coughs> Negative scalar curvature. Okay. 
meaning that the maximum of its core curvature is negative. Then, there exists a solution to this flow. Which exists for all time and more. Um, this metric has constant score curvature. Laying this maximum. So this gives you a way to get a Yamaha metric. Starting from a very general metric. Maybe not very symmetric. So, basically, I have to explain you two steps of the proof. The first step is why there is a solution, and the second step is why it converges. So, let me do that. I would prove it for surfaces because it's kind of easier to, to explain, the computation are a little easier uh, and the general setting is the same in higher dimensions. So the first thing might the following. If you have a solution of this culture normalized the curve, then it has the following form. The metric is so multiple of the initial one by some scalar functions. So, this is a very special evolution because in general, so your G, you have to think about uh, to think about it as a 2 by 2 matrix it's, uh, it's a quadratic form of the dungeon space so you can move the all matrix <coughs> I'm just saying, well, I'm moving every coefficient at the same rate Okay, so this is called Conformal evolution. And what means conformal? It means that even if you change the length of the vector on the tangent space, you don't change the angle between them. Okay. 
Now, if you, if you know that your solution had this form, you plug it in in this equation, okay? What does it become? Well, it becomes the derivative of vt times exponential vt dt which is my metric is equal to r max minus r dt times, sorry, times g0 times e dt g0 so you see that these two cancel and you just have a PDE for the function PT. And there we are very happy because a PDE on functions is much easier to solve than a PDE on matrices because the metric is the field of matrices. Okay? So I have started with PD on matrices and eventually I just have to solve PD on functions. What is this PD? This is given by the following lemma. If you have two metrics which are related at exponential v g0, then you can relate the curvature, the curvature g1 is exponential minus v times Laplacian for g0 of v plus so remember, I explained to you yesterday what was the Laplace. It's something like the sum of the second derivative, but it's really related to the measure. Uh, so you see, this curvature for the new metric is just given by the the O one plus some terms which are taken over. So I will not do the proof because the only way to prove that is. Write the metric in explicit coordinates and do the computation. Oh. And this is not finished. But, <laughs> the, but that's the way you that the way it is, something you can keep in mind about these geometric flows is that you have very good and intuitive geometric ideas, but so at many points in the middle, you have to do some dirty computations because that's the way it works. Otherwise, you cannot prove it. Anymore. So, what does give me this equation if I plug in the, the express solution for the curvature which should over there. So remember, 
what we've seen yesterday, the evolution of Vt is minus positive function times the Laplacian of Vt plus some terms which when there is no derivative of Vt. So this is exactly what we have called yesterday. A parabolic equation. And what we have seen yesterday is that if you start from any continuous B0, this has a solution. This means exactly that the flow has a solution for some time. Maybe it's more. And the other thing we said yesterday is that a solution exists as long at, as it doesn't go to infinity somewhere and it has to stay parabolic so you see that if this goes to infinity this becomes zero so you're in trouble more huh? the solution exists as long as bt stays longer I'm just using what we've seen yesterday for this equation. So now I have to show that this Vt stays bounded. Okay? But first of all, before showing that, I'm going to show how the curvature of the solution equal. So if you have a solution to the flow, then the curvature satisfies the following. The derivative in time of the curvature equal to minus Laplacian but not the Laplacian for time 0, the Laplacian for time t of the curvature plus R G T or minus minus R G you see that this equation for the curvature is even nicer than this one because you don't have any exponential, you just have the derivative, a Laplacian, and the polynomial. So, this is kind of easier to study. Um, what can you get from this? Uh, well, how, how do you prove that? Well, still, <coughs> kind of dirty computations. It's always the same story. Once you know how to do the computations and once you know the answer, it's easy. But if you just look for some answer, it's kind of painful. Maybe you should give a reference if they're interested in the dirt and the pain. So the, be the best place, to my knowledge, where this is done in some intelligent way is the book by Bess called Einstein Manifold. And the first chapter, the book in general is, is kind of diffi difficult because you have everything which was known on Einstein Manifold like 15 years ago. But the first chapter gives a lot of interesting information. 
So, now let's go back to our problem. Remember yesterday, we've seen parabolic equation and we've seen maximum principle. And this gives us something very interesting. If the curvature at type 0 is between these bonds, then if you have a solution Okay, so this is very important. They say that the curvature will not go further than the initial one. And the proof, I think I mentioned, is just apply the maximum principle. The very one I gave you yesterday When you have a solution, then this map, the, the factor which comes before the metric, stays always more than one. Well, this is just the previous lemma because Vt is zero at the beginning, so since it's increasing it's more than it's more than zero. And it's bound to the both by the <coughs> the quotient between the two bonds of curvature. Remember, this is the minimum but it's negative, so the in absolute value is bigger. Okay? And the proof is just <laughs> to apply the maximum principle. To the equation which I had named E1, which was the one giving the evolution from E2. Remember, you apply the maximum principle to this equation using the fact that you know that EVT is always bigger than 1 and the curve should be less than R max. You put everything in it and you get that you have this one. And what this tells you? Well, it tells you that your VT never explodes, so that the solution always exists.
and it, it tells you like for free something else it tells you that it converges And why so? So, this one is okay, and the second one, well, just proof for all x, pt of x is increasing and bounded above. So, I just know there is something. Now I want to understand my limits, and in particular, I want to show that it's a smooth metric with constant curvature. So keep in mind this evolution equation of the curvature because what I'm going to show you now is that the curvature is converging itself is converging to a constant. So remember we have some evolution equation for this one and you plug it all these big functions in this equation and you use the maximum principle of it, as we have learned yesterday and plaf it works and it gives you this one. So what do we know? We know that 
GT goes to some EV0, EV infinity, some G infinity metric, and that the curvature goes to R max. And the corollary, all of them, so V infinity is smooth. And the curvature of G infinity is constant. And even the speed of conversion of the whole curve <coughs> at order k, like we've seen yesterday, is less than some constant. So you see, it converges exponentially fast at all order of the metric G infinity. And the proof? You use these two facts and you use Schilder estimates. So remember, these Schilder estimates allow you to start from a continuous convergence, you don't know anything about the limits and since you have parabolic equation, you, you put it in the machine and you will have a smooth convergence. And basically I'm done with the proof of the theorem. Okay. Because I think that the, the solution exists, the flow converges, and at the limit you have constant curvature. So before leaving you, I will just mention what are the other flows, geometric flows, which exists and which are well studied. So, the flow is still a family of metric following some equation. It's I think that is a solution of the volume normalized. Something very similar on the previous one we had. We've got the scalar curvature at point x, and you've got a different constant there, which is the average of the scalar curvature. It's a different normalization for me. And the other one and third it's a solution.
So what do we know about that? Then there's three zero volume, meaning that if you have a solution, the volume is constant. The volume normal as the MIB flow always exists and converges. And when the curvature is positive, you remember I've only told you about the negative case. When the curvature is positive, it's very hard. has only been shown in 2010. Um, the Richard film 